Why hello, it's me again, Damien Gatto, here for another reaction video. Today we're about to react to a video by a Lazy Masquerade, great channel, be sure to check them out. We're about to see her by a Lazy Masquerade is 10 more photos with creepy backstories. So let's have fun and get this party started. Let's a uh, a go. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Whether you've been following this channel for a long time, or you've only heard a few of my creepy stories and mysteries, you've probably realized the value of staying safe and secure, even while surfing the web. With most of us spending multiple hours each day online, myself included, it's safe to say the internet knows a lot about us. Unfortunately these days, there are plenty of people out there trying to get their hands on that data of yours. One of the best ways to protect yourself is by using a VPN. That's where Nord comes in. NordVPN is extremely reliable and convenient, with super fast servers and 24-7 customer support. Want to stay hidden online? Nord's got your back with double data encryption for increased anonymity. Want more peace of mind? Their VPN protects your communications and personal data, and makes hacking into your devices virtually impossible. With NordVPN, your information will always be protected, no matter which country you're in. Right now they've got a special offer on. Head on over to nordvpn.com forward slash lazylegion or use coupon code lazylegion and you'll make a huge 70% saving. Sign up for their 3 year plan and they'll even throw an extra month in for free. Find that unique URL in the description or comment section and take advantage of that spine chilling deal. This is the last ever photo taken of Engler Hogland, who went missing on her way home from football practice. It was April 5th, 2008. In the setting, it's Janssen, Sweden. A local resident was out testing his new digital camera, taking random pictures of anything and everything in the area, getting a feel for how it worked. While doing so, he snapped this image of Engler. He had no idea he had just inadvertently taken the last ever photograph of her alive. When Engler didn't return home after practice that day, her mother called her cell phone. Despite numerous tries to get through to her, her daughter didn't answer. That was completely unlike her. Needless to say, she went out looking for Engler, and in doing so, made a chilling discovery. She found Engler's bike, the same one she was riding in this photograph, abandoned in the woods. There was no other trace of her anywhere. Her mother notified the authorities immediately. This case got a lot of media attention, not only in Sweden, but across all of Scandinavia. Search parties were formed to look for Engler, and areas that were even remotely close to where she'd vanished were scoured with a fine-tooth comb. Everybody hoped and prayed that this was just a case of a child going on an adventure, getting lost in the forest, and that she'd soon be found safe and well. <coughs> But as the hours rolled into days, that hope began to dwindle. When the man who had been snapping photos that fateful day realized that he had actually taken Engler's picture just before she disappeared, he came forward with his camera. On it, investigators found another photo that was of extreme interest. An image captured moments before this one of Engler. It was a picture of a red Saab 900. It almost appeared to be following the girl. This was the lead the investigators had been looking for. By tracing the license plates, they were able to track down the car's owner, Anders Eklund, a 42-year-old truck driver. When questioned, he immediately confessed to killing Engler, and even led the authorities to where he'd hidden her remains. Despite confessing to taking Engler's life, and despite the miraculously captured photograph of him following her as she rode home, Eklund claimed that his actions that day had merely been a coincidence, and that they weren't premeditated. He said that he had never met the youngster before, and when he stepped out of his car to go and talk to her, she became frightened and kicked him in the shin. Angered, he advanced on her, at which point Engler began screaming. Worried what people might think, he strangled Engler in order to silence her, and dragged her- Seriously, man? 
a girl kicks you, screams, and then your first instinct is to strangle? How does that make it look any better? It just makes you look like a psychopath, you asshole. Why don't people think? Lifeless body into the woods. It was all just a big misunderstanding, according to him. Yeah, okay, bud. That sounds like a perfectly innocent and normal alibi. Yeah, right. Eklund's DNA was tested, and the results were shocking. Eight years prior to this, a 31-year-old woman named Penilla Helgren had been strangled until all of the life was snuffed out of her. No, then that, then that implies that the thing he said about no premeditation is actually a lie. I mean, there, there's a pattern. How can you say it's not premeditated when there's a pattern? Unless he's just strangling women at random. Slayer then had his way with her, leaving behind vital evidence as a result. The DNA traces at the scene matched with Eklund's DNA perfectly. When asked about this, he again confessed, but again insisted that he hadn't meant to hurt that woman either. It was all just another misunderstanding. Anders Eklund was sentenced to life in prison for his heinous actions, and is currently a suspect for other cases still under investigation. At first glance, this looks like a pretty ordinary selfie. Just three young girls smiling, enjoying their time together, their hair blowing in the wind. Thing is, that light on the right hand side of the screen belies a hidden darkness. It's actually the headlight of an oncoming train, which hit them moments later. The driver blared his horn, unable to stop the locomotive. Trains can take up to a mile to stop once the brakes are hit. Sadly, the girls didn't even flinch, completely in their own world, and just having fun. Seconds later, they disappeared under the train, their lives extinguished, and a whole lot of grief ignited for both their families and the driver of the train. Their names were Essa Ricca and Kelsey and Savannah Webster. This image goes to show the importance of paying attention to your surroundings. You never know what's coming around the corner. Well, I'm gonna have nightmares tonight. The year was 1961. While going about their business, the crew of the Captain Theo noticed something floating in the sea beside their ship. It was a disintegrating cork float. Inside it was 11-year-old Terry Jo Dapperold. She had been drifting in the water for four days without food, water, or protection from the elements, and was near the point of death. By some miracle, they crossed paths with her and were able to save her life. How Terry Joe came to be in this predicament is harrowing, to say the least. Terry Joe and her entire family had been aboard another ship called Bluebell, a small sailing catch that was taking the Duperolds from Green Bay, Wisconsin, to the Bahamas. The ship was being skippered <coughs> by Julian Harvey, who also brought his sixth wife along for the journey. But it couldn't have been a happy marriage, because while en route, Harvey drowned his wife in the ocean. After being discovered by Terry Joe's father, Harvey took a large knife and butchered him, along with Mrs. Duperold and Terry Joe's two siblings, leaving her as the only survivor on board. Frickin' damn! I can only imagine what that kid's- I can only imagine what that kid went through, seeing all that. Oy. Well, much less to say that kid'll probably need some therapy. But I'm just saying, the world can be a messed up place sometimes, I'm just saying. Rather than end her life too, Harvey instead sabotaged his ship, abandoning it in his dinghy and leaving Terry Joe to drown in the sea. Just before the boat sank, the young girl was able to untie the float and launch herself into the ocean. During those four long days at sea, her float began to fall to pieces, forcing her to balance on the side of it with her legs in the water. As such, Parrotfish kept biting her feet. It's hard to imagine what Terry Joe must have gone through. Losing your whole family in one fell swoop is horrifying enough, but to then drift alone for four days in the ocean, just awaiting to either drown, perish from thirst or sun exposure, 
or to be picked apart by sea creatures, yet doesn't bear thinking about. And all of this at the age of eleven. Harvey himself had been rescued by another ship the day after the incident. In the dinghy with him was the lifeless body of Terry Joe's younger sister. He claimed that a freak accident had destroyed their ship, and that although he had tried to save the youngster's life, he was unable to. When he later learned that Terry Joe had survived and been rescued, Harvey checked himself into a motel under a fake name and ended his own life with a razor blade. Had Terry Joe not been rescued, he had likely have gotten away. So basically, he just took the coward's way out. With everything. Harvey probably wanted his wife out of the picture to get his hands on some insurance money. One of his previous marriages ended after his wife perished in a car crash. He was driving the vehicle at the time, and he netted himself a healthy sum. Two of his past boats had also sunk under mysterious circumstances, yielding him even more money. What's unknown about this case is why he left Terry Joe alive on board the vessel. Many years later, in an interview, she herself said, I think he probably thought I'd go down with the ship. It's still puzzling he'd even take that gamble. Like, there has to be more to it than that. Like, he kills the parents, the siblings, but not her. And yes, he was probably thinking, maybe she'll just go down with the ship. Yeah, but... It still begs the question, why would he take that gamble? You know something, I'm not even going to think too hard on it. You can never understand the mind of a psychopath. But I'm just saying, I can only imagine what that kid went through. It's horrible. Hmm. Well, hope the kid's okay. What you're looking at on screen is basketballer Mark Jackson's official 1989 to 1990 trading card. Until recently, this card was just like any other from that period. In August 2018, however, a keen-eyed collector spotted something unusual in this picture. Behind Jackson, sitting courtside, are the Menendez brothers, Lyle and Eric. This photo was taken after they both killed their parents for insurance money in their Beverly Hills mansion. In August of 89, the two men, 21 and 18 at the time, burst into their family living room with a pair of shotguns and fired 15 <coughs> rounds into the back of their mother and father while they watched TV, completely obliterating them. The brothers then went to a movie theater, dumping their equipment and changing their clothes on the way, and afterwards drove home and pretended to discover their parents' lifeless bodies. This image was taken before the authorities caught the two men, who were both going about their lives as if they'd done nothing wrong. In fact, they were living extremely lavishly now that their parents were out of the picture. When the insurance money came through, they both went on a spending spree, blowing a million dollars in six months on Rolexes, cars, tennis lessons, parties. Isn't the normal etiquette to when you kill someone to keep a low profile? That seems like the saying. Not trying to give advice here. I'm just saying, normally from what I've what I've seen, this is the worst way you could have hit in your actions. I mean, man, you splurge like crazy. You basically, it's basically just it's, just, it's like saying, "Hey, arrest me." I mean, I'm just saying. And relevant to this video, courtside tickets to basketball games. For nearly thirty years, the two sociopaths have been. But I'm just saying, you have to be really one messed up SOB to kill your parents for insurance money. I mean, you have to be one belligerent asshole child. I mean, just saying, I hope you got the worst of life sentences. Been hiding in the background of an official piece of NBA merchandise, completely unnoticed. Little did anyone realize that the image captured the two brothers, living it up on money they'd made from taking their parents' lives. Makes you wonder what else is hiding in the background of other photos that just hasn't been noticed yet. Shortly after this photo was taken, the brothers were apprehended. The spoiled siblings had huge egos and thought that they could get away with anything. E 
parenticide. Thankfully, that turned out not to be the case, and they both received full life sentences to be served in different jails. They've both since gotten married while behind bars. Lyle, twice. Before this discovery, these Mark Jackson cards were going for about 10 cents each. Now they're going for a lot more. The photo on screen is of Issei Segawa, also known as Pang, a notorious celebrity in Japan. At only 4 foot 9, he's small in stature, but not in personality. His notoriety was at its peak between 1986 and 1997, during which time he constantly appeared on Japanese television as a guest speaker and commentator. He appeared in horror movies and wrote best-selling cookery books. Cookery books. Yeah. Notice how in this photo, he's eating a dish. Well, food was his claim to fame. But not just any food. Sagawa was a real-life cannibal. In 1981, while studying in Paris, France, he invited his classmate, René Hartevelt, a 25-year-old Dutch woman, to translate poetry together for an upcoming assignment. She agreed. While reading a poem at a desk in his apartment, Sagawa walked up behind her and shot her in the back of the neck with a hunting rifle. He then had his way with her remains. His ultimate plan, though, was to eat her. Sagawa considered himself short, weak, and ugly. Rene, on the other hand, was tall and beautiful, full of life. He believed that by consuming her, he could absorb her energy. He tried to bite into her flesh raw, but found it to be too difficult and unpalatable. So, he calmly walked to a local store, purchased a butcher's blade, and began slicing off parts of Rene's body to cook. He ate most of her face and chest, taking photos of her at each stage of his dining experience. When he was finally sated, he stored other parts of her in his refrigerator for later, placed the rest of her into two suitcases, and tried to dump them in a lake. Luckily, he was caught red-handed while trying to do so, and the officers found parts of Rene inside the two cases he was carrying. <laughs> luckily for Sagawa, and unluckily for the rest of us, his parents were extremely rich. His father hired a top lawyer for him, and he was able to escape jail time after being declared legally insane. Are you freaking serious? I don't care how much you care about your kid, your kid just ate a person. Your kid should rot in a jail, or either get executed. I'm sorry! Because obviously, once you get him out of jail, he's just gonna do it again. I understand some parents love their kids, but sometimes you just need to let them go to jail. Especially if they eat a person. Pretty sick. Have you ever watched? Have you? Has anybody ever watched the horror movie Wrong Turn? He was held in a French hospital, but when a Japanese author published a story about him, people in the land of the rising sun became morbidly curious about his story. He gained a sort of macabre celebrity status which no doubt contributed to the French authorities' decision to deport him back to Japan, where he was quickly determined to be sane after all. Now, with no charges against him, Sagawa checked himself out of hospital immediately, and remains a free man to this day, having served no time in prison whatsoever. <laughs> the photo of Sagawa you're looking at now was featured on the cover of a well-known Japanese magazine, Spa. It featured an article in which he reviewed a restaurant, Considering what he was famous for, that's in bad taste. Sagawa also went on to write a best-selling book about his killing of Rene. Certainly not a book for the faint of heart, as it goes into explicit detail about what he did. It's strange and disappointing to realize that someone like Sagawa could not only escape justice, but also go on to become famous and profit from his despicable actions. Now, given the context, this image of him eating with a cocky, dead-eyed stare becomes something truly haunting. He got away with it all, and he loves it. You'll be happy to know that things have changed. Nowadays, Sagawa is detested by the younger generations and has fallen out of the limelight. He struggles to find employment. Yeah, I bet. 
Issei Sagawa was born in Kobe, which is currently the city where I live. Yeah, internationally, I'm glad we're famous for our beef, and not for this guy. <laughs> This image is of Steven Webber Jr. proposing to his girlfriend while freediving at the Manta Resort on Pember Island, Tanzania. It was captured moments before his underwater marriage proposal turned tragic. The couple was staying in a room that was completely submerged in water, with glass windows so you could see out into the ocean all around you. Steven dived into the water, swam down to the glass window, and showed a note to his girlfriend Kenisha, who was watching and filming him from the other side of the glass. His note read, I can't hold my breath long enough to tell you everything I love about you, but everything I love about you, I love more every day. On the back, it said, Will you please be my wife? Marry me? He then pulled out a ring, and after a few seconds, swam up for air. Unfortunately, Stephen drowned before he could reach the surface. His girlfriend wrote on her Facebook page, You never emerged from those depths, so you never got to hear my answer. Yes. Yes. A million times, yes. Okay, now that is sad. Ugh. Well, that's depressing. Let's keep going. I will. Take a look at this seemingly normal photograph. This looks like a picture of your typical dorky uncle alongside his daughter, right? Well, the man in this photo is actually Dennis Rader, better known as the BTK killer. Over the span of 17 years, he took the lives of 10 people in the Wichita, Kansas metro area, including an entire family. He used everything from ropes and plastic bags to belts and pantyhose to strangle his victims. What made his actions even more harrowing, however, was that he liked to tie up the remains of those that he had slayed and photograph them in strange, contorted positions. He did so because it gave him satisfaction, and that was his motivation. This photo, taken during his daughter's graduation, was captured less than two years before his arrest. Now, Dennis Rader was obviously a deplorable human being, and even in his day-to-day -day life, he did some pretty despicable things. He became a dog catcher in Park City. People noted how he took special joy in bullying single women. One neighbor even complained that he had killed her dog for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Still, for the most part, he managed to fit in well enough to avoid being detected by the authorities for 17 long years. He'd send investigators letters, taunting them for their inability to find him, along with little dolls with tied-up hands and feet, symbolizing those he had taken the lives of. But for all his boldness, Raider had one major weakness. He was completely tech illiterate. So, one day, he sent one of his infamous letters to the cops, asking if they'd be able to trace him if he sent them a floppy disk. They, of course, said they wouldn't be able to, and, unbelievably, he actually sent them one. The authorities couldn't believe their luck. On the floppy desk, investigators found some metadata on a deleted document. It said, last modified by Dennis. From this, they were able to narrow down the suspects until it was obvious who the perp was. But that's where this photo comes into play. Despite being able to link the floppy desk to Dennis Rader, this still wasn't considered enough to bring him in. They needed a DNA sample. His daughter, pictured in this photo, had just graduated from Kansas State University's medical center. While there, she had to have a pap smear done. The authorities got a court order to take the smear and test the DNA. From that, they established a familial link to the DNA found at the crime scenes. And that's what brought Dennis Rader down. Rader was very upset that the police had lied to him about the disc being safe to send. I need to ask you, he said to the lead detective on the case. How come you lied to me? The detective simply answered, because I was trying to catch you. When his house was searched after his capture, the cops came across a treasure trove of pictorial evidence. 
Some were of BTK's victims, but others were of himself, masked and dressed up in women's clothes. He had taken these pictures to reenact his crimes. I kind of feel bad for his daughter, though. I mean, imagine living your life not knowing that your parent is a belligerent serial killer. That has to be... Oy. These images helped to give us an insight into his mind at the time he was active. Unsettling stuff, to say the least. This is a photo of Pavel Kashin, a Russian freerunner. The image, taken on the 2nd of July, 2013, captures his final stunt on the edge of a 16-story high building in St. Petersburg. A split second after this photo was taken, Pavel made a fatal mistake when he failed to land his backflip correctly. He lost his footing and plummeted over the side of the building. He was 20 years old. His parents, who saw this final image of their son, issued a statement saying they hope this photo will deter other daredevils from risky jumps. Not exactly one photo for this entry, but a whole set. I know I'm cheating a little, but stay with me. Regular viewers of this channel might remember a video I made a while back. Five video clips with disturbing backstories. In it, I talked about the dating game killer, Rodney Alcala, a man who appeared on a TV dating show back in the 70s, who later turned out to be a serial murderer. I know lots of you might have missed that episode, seeing how he got hit by the yellow button of demonetization. So, for those of you who didn't tune in, the short story is that between 1968 and 1979, Alcala claimed the lives of at least eight people across various states in the US, though his exact number of victims remains unclear, and could be as many as 130. Alcala's methods were simple but effective. He'd pretend to be a professional photographer, and offer his potential victims the opportunity for a private, high-quality photo shoot. Lured in by his good looks and charm, many people, mostly women, accepted his proposal. Once he'd gained their trust by taking a few snaps of them in public, he'd invite them to join him in a more private setting. When he had them alone to himself, that's when Alcala would not only take their final pictures, but their lives as well. When he was finally apprehended, investigators found Alcala's camera, along with multiple photo albums. There were thousands of pictures of hundreds of different people, all of them potential victims. As such, it remains unknown just how many lives Alcala claimed during his 11-year rampage. Over the years, the authorities have been able to track down some of the individuals from the photos, but many of them remain unaccounted for. Despite there being a public request for people from the photos to come forward, the identities and well-being of many of the photographed people remain unknown to this day. Despite their innocent appearance, any of these photos could be of people he slayed moments later. Do you recognize anyone in these images? If so, you might hold the answer to a small part of a very large, very sinister mystery. This image shows the crew of the ill-fated Apollo 1 mission huddled around a model of their command module, hands clasped in prayer. The photo was taken during a promo shoot for their upcoming mission, but the story behind this particular image is both dark and tragic in equal measure. You see, this picture wasn't released along with the other promotional material. Of course, NASA didn't want people thinking that their astronauts didn't have complete faith in their ship, nor did they want people to think that the mission even had a chance of failing but the crew. Before this picture was taken, they'd expressed their concerns about their spaceship's problems, specifically about the amount of flammable material in the cabin. Unfortunately, their points fell on deaf ears, so command pilot Gus Grissom, senior pilot Ed White, and pilot Roger B. Chaffee, the three-man crew, presented this parody image to ASPO manager Joseph Shear, along with the message, it isn't that we don't trust you, Joe, but this time, you have decided to go over your head. Finding the image humorous, Shia gave the order to remove the flammable material from the cabin, but didn't supervise the removal himself. 
as such, the flammable material remained inside. Soon after this photo was taken, during a test in which the three crew members were inside the command module, an electrical fire broke out. Over the intercom, one of the crew could be heard shouting, Hey, we got a fire in the cockpit! Because the test had been labelled as low risk, emergency preparedness was very poor. All the engineers could do was watch their monitors as the module filled with smoke. The plug door hatch couldn't be opened due to the pressure from inside the module, and soon the whole of the inside was engulfed in flames. We got a bad fire, we're burning up, screamed another of the crew over the intercom. Then, screaming, then, silence. The flames spread so rapidly, they never stood a chance. Their concerns had been valid all along, and sadly, the order to remove the flammable material had gotten lost along the way. Though intended to be a tongue-in-cheek jab at their boss, this image now stands as a testament to three brave men who undertook extreme risks in the name of progress. It's thanks to their sacrifice that the Apollo mission was ultimately a success. Shortly before his untimely end, Command Pilot Grissom told a reporter, If we die, we want people to accept it. We hope that if anything happens to us, it will not delay the program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. Hey guys, so Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's video. It's getting harder and harder to find pictures that haven't been covered like a million times by other channels, so I hope you didn't know too many of these already. And if you did enjoy the video, be sure to smash that like button, or I'll smash you. Before we end the video today, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon, and to all of the people who've become members of my channel, especially my biggest supporters. Alicia L. Matthew J. Bauer, Abigail Grunewald, Crawford K. McDonald, Monica Mendoza, Charles Wilson, Tom King, Alex Greensall, Philip Westra, Procubidine Natter, Gina Valera, Anna Maywim, Sarah Ramirez, Carl Martin, Sloan Crawford, Nadine, Darius Sape, Connor Lothar, Hamish, Sieg, Carlisle, Infamous Sempapi, Mystic the Manakeet, Alba Madrano, Silas Geist, Azriel Warakai, and Miss Ayami Stroud. Well, that about wraps things up for this one, guys. Keep your eyes peeled for the next video. And until then, you all stay spooky. <clears throat> well, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. This was by A Lazy Masquerade. Great channel. Be sure to check them out. And also be sure to check out my channel, um, Damien Gatto Gameplays and Reactions. And I do have to say, these stories were these stories were definitely creepy. I mean, wow. Now, those are some creepy backstories. But besides that, be sure to leave me comments or any videos that I could write to recommend in the description down below. Thank you. Have a nice opinion today. I hope you all take care. I'm about to say, that was just plain... Well, spooky.